Hello, my name is Nick Chater from Warwick Business School's Behavioural Science Group. And I want to tell you today about a book uh, I published recently called The Mind is Flat, advancing the rather unexpected thesis, I think, that while we think of ourselves as having enormous mental depth, enormous richness of beliefs and practices uh, and uh, principles of all kinds, in fact, we're improvisers. Our mind is run, running along uh, a shallow, uh, sh on shallow waters where beneath us, there's remarkably little. On the other hand, we shouldn't be disturbed by the idea that we're uh, less profound in some sense than we thought, because it turns out we achieve the trick of creating the illusion of mental depth by astonishing creativity and cleverness. And that's where the real secret of intelligence lies. I want to start by giving us a sense of the way in which we create the illusion of richness, uh, initially of the perceptual world, but later we'll talk about our inner world. And this goes under the name in philosophy and psychology of the grand illusion. So here is a beautiful uh, illusion created by the French vision scientist Jacques Nino, the 12 dots illusion. And uh, you should be able to see before you a rectangular grid with 12 black dots uh, within it. In fact, though, you'll almost certainly find you can only see a small number of these dots at once. In fact, you may find one or more appearing and all the others are disappearing. It does slightly depend on viewing distance, so you might want to experiment with that. Now, this is a very strange illusion, um, partly because it's revealing to us that while we might imagine that we can simultaneously see everything in front of us, we certainly can't. So in this illusion, um, we find that the, the dot we're looking at is visible, and perhaps one or two dots nearby. But the whole is not. The whole f uh, set of dots is, is not visible, even though it would be if, or if the grid background was taken away, of course. And that grid background has been carefully judged, heavily created, so that if you're not looking for directly at a dot, the mix of the, the black and the surrounding white for each dot blends together in a, to blur into something rather similar, in fact, very similar indeed, to the, to the gray of the, of the background grid. So if you're not looking at a dot, there's a danger it just disappears into oblivion. And to see that dot, you've either got to be looking and concentrating directly on it, or you've got to have um, some top-down um, structure in your mind which is telling you that that dot should be there because there's a, there's a pattern that you're trying to hold on to. So for example, you might see a square, you might find yourself seeing a vertical line, a horizontal line, or even a diagonal line. And that top-down process of, of holding in your mind a particular a shape and enhancing the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the perception of the dots within that shape can allow you to see several dots simultaneously. What you can't do is see two shapes at once. So you'll never find yourself saying, oh, at the top right I see a square, and at the bottom left or in some other part of the image I see a diagonal line. You'll see one structure or another. And that's also telling, I think, because it's a, an illustration of the general point that to, a pro to an approximation, maybe quite a good approximation, we can only see one pattern at a time. A square, a vertical line, a horizontal line, a diagonal line, but not more than one. Here's an illustration of a similar point from a lovely set of stimuli created by um, Wang and Paschler uh, studying uh, the um, limits of visual attention. So the task they gave people was the task of, for example, um, determining whether or not the, uh, the top two grids made of, of colored squares are the same or not, or below, are they symmetrical, or below that is one a rotated version of the other. And this is a pretty difficult task. You might imagine that you could simply load all this information into your mind at once if you could um, process something as complex as a square, and it's not that complex. Um, you could imagine you could load all that information into your mind at once and just say yes or no instantly. But of course you can't. In fact, your first strategy is going to be to look at the individual colored squares separately and think, oh, I see two greens. Yes, that's true on the right-hand side too, and two reds, and then a blue, and so on. Now, after a while, in fact, very quickly, I think, most of us will realize there's a better way of doing it than that. And the better way is to look one color at a time. So what you can do, and this is actually Huang and Pashler's very deep point, is you can focus on the shape constructed by, focus, by, by thinking of a particular color. They think of this as shrink-wrapping that color, in, uh, uh, and suddenly all the shrink-wrapped uh, area becomes visible. Everything else, though, is just a, a jumble of different colored things with no clear structure to it. So you can ask yourself about the reds, and you can see the red pattern on the, on the right-hand side. You can see that image appear directly, 
when you look at the left-hand object of the pair and at the right-hand object, and you think, yes, they are the same. Now let's check yellows, let's check greens, let's check blues, whatever we like. And if you focus on a sing single color, a pattern emerges, and you can then check for that pattern in the other image. But notice what you can't do, and this is rather analogous to what we talked about just a moment ago, is you can't think, well, let's just look at all the colors at a time. Why don't I just look at the pattern for red and the pattern for green and the pattern for yellow and the pattern for blue? and compare them simultaneously. No, you can't do that. You can only see one pattern at a time. And that is a very, very profound limitation. Let me give you yet another example. So reading. So if you give somebody a, a sentence such as, it's remarkable, remarkable how little we actually see at any instant, even though, blah, blah, blah. This comes from research from Keith Rayner's lab, who pioneered uh, eye tracking research in the, um, in the 1970s on, on reading. Now, in this uh, type of study, what you do is you uh, look at where people's eyes are looking by putting an eye tracking um, eye tracking system on the, uh, putting them in an eye tracking system. So you know where they're looking as they read across the screen, and rather cunningly, you create letters just where they're looking, and everything else is replaced with X's. So initially, they're looking at the uh, the, the early part of remarkable. That's the first grey circle. And so there's a little window of letters, a few before and rather more after, of, uh, which are perfectly coherent in English. But everywhere else, you have just uh, blank X's. And then as you move your eye, as you hop to the end of Remarkable, we move the whole window along and then the whole window along again. So the window of, as it were, lucidity bounces along the screen. Now, if you were in this experiment and I were looking over your shoulder, I'd see a line of X's with a little patch of text bobbling uh, from the left to the right. But if you were in the experiment, you wouldn't see anything like that. You'd simply read as normal. If you were asked, um, well, um, did you see any X's? Was there something strange about this reading experience? You'd say, not really. No, I was just reading as normal. And the reason you're reading as normal is that the letters you're able to take in are present, and all the letters that you're not able to take in, all those X's, um, are, um, are, are oblivious, you're oblivious to them anyway. So as long as it's the case that the letters that you're actually looking right at are available, you read as normally. Now, of course, when you look at a patch of text, uh, look at a, a, an open novel, for example, you have a sense there are words everywhere. But in fact, most of those words can be replaced by X's and you'd never know it, as long as the words you're looking right at are, uh, are present. And it's not too much of an exaggeration to say that roughly speaking, when we read, we read roughly one word at a time. Some words are rather long and you have to look at them twice. Some words you skip over and you have a little bit of an idea of what's coming up and what's just gone. But roughly speaking, it's one pattern story. You read one word at a time and most of the other words are essentially, uh, essentially gone. Now, that's strange enough and I want to give you uh, some more examples in a moment um, of, of how this applies, not just to perception, but to your own, your own uh, higher level, more abstract uh, thoughts and feelings. So just think, think for a second about what's happening, though, in, that, in those earlier examples. You have the sense of great richness. You have the sense of a page of text. You have a sense of all those colors in front of you. Um, you, you have a sense of that, that, that you must be able to see all the dots and lines on an image. And it turns out you can't. It turns out that that, um, that, that that's complexity is actually being fabricated from tiny snippets. Now, could that apply to more complicated cases, or at least maybe not more complicated, but cases that we think of as not about perception, but, a, but closer to our, our, um, our, ourselves, as it were, as, as individuals, closer to the things we, we think and feel. So here's a, an example, which is a very famous one from Lev Kuleshov, um, who is a Russian film director in the early years of the 20th, 20th century. And here is one of his famous actors, Ivan Mazukin. Um, and and his, uh, his acting style is, is, as you can see here, extremely understated. Because here he is on the, in the top picture, um, where paired with a, 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 an image supposed to invoke a, 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 a dead child, here he is looking very, very sad. I mean, controlled, but clearly, clearly in a state of great distress. On the other hand, when paired with a, an image of a soup bowl, uh, not a terribly appetizing soup bowl, uh, you can see, if you look closely at him, that he's, he's emitting a sense of, of hunger. And then you have potential lust when, when paired with the, uh, the picture of a, of a young woman. 
The strange thing is, of course, and you can see it quite clearly here, uh, is, is, is that this is, of course, the very same photograph. This isn't understated acting. This isn't acting at all. This is just a blank, uh, rather neutral expression, which we, as viewers, will reconst reconstrue based on the context. Now, that's interesting because it means that when we're trying to understand the facial expression of an actor or anyone else around us, we are using the context to work out what we think they're feeling. But it's also the case, of course, that we're doing that when we're thinking about our own thoughts and feelings. So if I'm trying to work out what I'm feeling, it may be that, of course, I'm not going to use my own face. I can't see my, my own face unless I catch myself in the mirror. But I can feel a range of physiological sensations flowing through my body. Um, and those physiological sensations are just as ambiguous, in fact, more ambiguous than, than facial expressions. And I'm going to use the surrounding context to work out what is it that I'm feeling now? Let's have another example with uh, a visual case. This is um, Senator Jim Webb, a relatively, uh, not tremendously well-known senator outside the US at least. Um, and here he is in, uh, in two guises. One, um, looking extremely angry on the left there, absolutely outraged. Uh, something terrible has happened and he's very, very cross about it. On the other hand, on the right-hand side, he's in a moment of great triumph. Victory is assured, everyone's behind him. Um, you can see that it's, it's, it's a delighted, incredibly positive uh, expression. And of course, you will have guessed that these are, of course, the same, the same picture. And this is a, uh, taken from an, an article in Trends of Cognitive Sciences some years ago, um, a well-known well -known image, but a very remarkable phenomenon, a very general phenomenon, that understanding a facial expression depends so crucially on the context from which it is taken. And of course, that doesn't apply to, as I say, to faces. It applies to our own feelings. So if I have a surge of adrenaline uh, or a surge of lethargy, what I attribute that to, what I interpret that as, as an emotion, would depend on the context I'm in, just as I say, in the same way that I'm trying to work out what the, uh, the senator is feeling here. And this means, in general, I, I actually have to work quite hard to figure out what it is that I actually feel. And it's not just what I feel, it's actually what I also prefer. So here's an experiment done by Peter Johansson, Lars Hall, and, and colleagues at the University of London, Sweden, um, they gave people a, a range of choices. In this particular experiment, the most famous um, uh, paper in science many years ago now, they give people pictures of photographs. And the question is, which of these um, faces do you prefer? No particular um, agenda, just which, which seems to you preferable. And as you'll see, the person points, say, um, in fig figure B, at the face they happen to think, well, perhaps that one. Uh, and then they're handed that um, the card on which that face is presented. But then, when they look at the cards, you'll notice that the other face has appeared. It's a cunning trick that they're given one card, they think, but actually they get the other one. So they are told that they, they think they prefer one face, they're shown the other face, and what do they do? Now, this is only done occasionally, so there, I think there are 32 trials in this experiment, and on three times the trick is played. And the question is, um, do people notice, the first question? And the answer is mostly no. Sometimes people do notice, but they mostly don't. And in fact, if you tell them, or if, if Petra and Lars tell people at the end of the experiment about the trick, and they say, well, sometimes we play this trick on people, do you think we play this on you? Most people think that the, the trick was not played on. But then the question they're asked, and this is more interesting, is, well, why did you choose that face? And remember, for the majority of people, this is not in fact the face they chose, but they haven't noticed that. Interestingly, people are able to give a lucid and ex uh, extensive explanation of the, why they chose that face, or at least it's as lucid and as extensive as it would be if it was the face uh, that they actually did chose, choose. But of course, this, this um, explanation must be a post hoc rationalization. You must be making it up. You can't really know why you chose this face because you did not choose this face. It's the wrong one. So the very fact that you can concoct, you can improvise an explanation of why you made a choice when it wasn't, in fact, the wrong choice, it's got to be telling you something. So in fact, I think what it's telling you is you're an inherent rationalizer. When I ask you why you choose something, you will tell me, give me a reason, uh, but it won't be a reason that is in, a, in any way directly rooted in the actual causes of your choice. Because if it were, then you'd realize when it was the wrong choice, or at least you'd be baffled. You'd have some sense of perplexity. You'd think, well... I look inside my mind and I find all the considerations within me telling me that I preferred that face, but strangely, I seem to choose this one. What's going on? But there's no such problem. 
because you're concocting the answer at the very moment you're asked. Now, this is interesting going back to our previous points because remember how you have the sense of enormous richness of the world because you are uh, taking little snippets of information and, and piecing them together piece by piece, one pattern at a time, one word, um, one color, um, one, as it were, dot or shape, shape. So we're getting the sense of enormous richness, but, but, but building it up gradually. And the same is true, I think, for our a sense of our own preferences. So if you ask me what I like and what I dislike, I can think, oh, well, I have a huge range of preferences about all kinds of things. And ask me a question, I'll tell you the answer, and I'll explain it. And I will explain it, but the reason I'll explain it is because, as it were, I'm attending to the problem of generating an explanation, I'm doing that in the moment. And if you ask me to, to, to provide an explanation, I'm so quick and fluent at it that I think that, uh, that, that, that explanation was already lurking within me, but it wasn't. Just in the same way that when you ask me about the richness of the visual world, whether I can see all the words on a page, whether I can see all the colors on a bookshelf, I have a sense of, oh, of course I can. But what I'm really doing is just asking myself a question, well, what's that book over there? Or what's that word? Answering that question so rapidly that it's as it were at my, at my mental fingertips. And when things are so much at your mental fingertips, you can concoct at the answer in the moment. But you have the feeling you looked it up within your inner, inner self. You had it already loaded into your mind. But that's not really the case. Another example in the same vein, this is a, a famous experiment by Dutton and Aronson in, um, in the University of British Columbia in the 70s. And here we have people walking across a, a high bridge and uh, further down the creek, as it were, there's a lower bridge. And those are crucial cases we want to consider. And an experimenter, a female experimenter, would stand at one end of the bridge. And as male bridge crossers went across, they would be interviewed, uh, asked, asked a few questions, and given the possibility, uh, asked whether they would like to have the phone number of the, the female interviewer. And they could uh, then uh, take, take this away in case they had any ethical or other concerns about the experiment. Now, of course, the, uh, the experiment itself was, the, was essentially a dummy. The thing that mattered here was whether or not, or not people asked for the phone number and whether they rang it. And that was assumed to be a proxy for whether or not the, uh, the male bridge crosser found the female experimenter attractive and, found, and would like to give her a call. And it turns out that there's a very substantial boost in the number of calls made and the number of phone, calls up, phone numbers asked for when the male bridge crossers had just walked across the high bridge. Now, why would that be? Well, the idea and the prediction uh, of Dutton and Aaron um, was that rather uh, counterintuitively, and when you've walked across a high bridge, which is obviously a scary experience, which will make you very adrenalized, um, you don't necessarily attribute that adrenaline to the high bridge walking experience. So you come across to the, to the end of the bridge and you meet a new person. Now there's adrenaline flowing through you and you have a sense that this person must perhaps be causing the adrenaline. I mean, she's asking you whether you'd like her phone number. The adrenaline flowing through you is um, giving a sense of Oh, what must this be? Maybe it's um, somebody I, I, I really have a cl I'm really clicking with. I really like this person. Um, so you ask for the phone number. So there's a case where you're where what people are doing is clearly improvising their um, their, their, their sense of who it is they're attracted to, and who they like, in the moment, and they're doing it based on a signal, uh, a signal which is the amount, the amount of adrenaline coursing through them, which in, in, on reflection clearly has another source. But because we're not thinking about that, uh, that other source, we're not thinking about the bridge at the time, we, 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 the person's engaged in the interview, after all, with the experimenter, that, uh, that it's very easy to make that what's called an attribution error, to think that the, the, source of the, um, the source of the adrenaline is the person, and therefore interpret that as attraction, and therefore ask for the phone number and call it, perhaps days later. So you might think from all this that the mind is a, a very um, unstable thing, and I think that's true to a degree. We are pretty unstable um, in that when you ask, give people different kinds of um, ways of framing the same problem, the whole of the literature on judgment and decision-making work of Kahneman to Versky and then and the huge series of experiments that have come out of that tradition. When you look at all those experiments, they are experiments in which you ask people the same thing several ways and they give you different answers. They're improvising differently. Now, they're not tapping into some kind of deep, deep preference. They're, they're improvising and if you ask people to improvise, to improvise in different, with different uh, cues and uh, hi highlighted bits of information, they'll give you different improvisations. But I want to stress in this very final section that nonetheless, 
it's not the case that we're completely malleable and we're a a complete jumble. And in fact, I think we should think of ourselves as amazingly creative, but also as attempting, striving continually to to rein in that creativity and to be coherent, uh, cohesive beings as far as we can. And it's pretty difficult and we're not tremendously cohesive, um, but our minds do the best they can. Let's start with the creativity, though. Um, This is a wonderful uh, image by a Japanese vision scientist uh, and physicist, Itasawa. And so you'll see on on the left this spiky sphere. And on the right, you see the very components of the spiky sphere um, but just randomly ju- jumbled, jum- uh, jumbled around. The extraordinary thing is that uh, the brain is able to take what are obviously, when you see them on the right, just flat 2D black images and turn them into a, a, a bright, um, snookable, um, with, uh, with spikes radiating out from it in, in an instant. It's, it's, a, it's an immediate thing to do. And yet we've probably never seen such an object um, but we create it instantly. And the one reason we create it is that it, it appears to provide a much cleaner and simpler explanation of all those particular bits of, of the image than would happen if we just imagined they were, were a random jumble. There is a random jumble on the right, but the, the, the left-hand version is much better explained by the assumption there's a 3D uh, bright uh, white ball with, with black spikes. That would explain the exact precise pattern. But the fact that the brain could find that uh, and find it essentially uh, instantly is quite quite astounding. So I think that should make us realise that we are astonishingly creative creatures. Even just to perceive the world requires the ability to search an enormous range of possible ways of reconstructing information and putting it together and finding the one that makes the most sense. And we're not always going to find the one that makes the most sense, but we're pretty good at it. And that's that's remarkable. On the other hand, though, um, the way we see things also de- is determined by things we're used to seeing. So although we can creatively create a rather abstract spiky spheres, we can also project things we're very familiar with, for example, human faces, onto a diverse range of, of real-world objects. So here, for example, we see on the re- left-hand side, um, not just a face, but a face with, for me, very particular emotive characteristics. For me, that this is a bag that's trying to trying to be alarming and scary. It's trying to be a threatening, authoritative kind of face. But if you look closely at it, you realise it knows it can't pull it off. The uh, uh, the cheese grater there is clearly trying to please. It's standing up, lovely and straight. It's smiling furiously. But you can see there's a sense in which it's 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 not confident that it's going to be liked and loved. The uh, the the slightly uh, woozy looking um, fence posts there look friendly. They're not in any way threatening, but you feel they're not a, not a fence post you want to ask a difficult question to. It's a friendly but slightly clueless sort of face. And on the, on the right-hand side, the look of terror and anxiety in, in the, the face of this sink is, is really quite painful to behold. And you feel it, whatever awful thing it's fearing, it needs to be, needs to be put out of its misery now. It can't go on with that level of, of, of anxiety. And what's wonderful about these is that they show, the, again, the astounding creativity by which we are able to project our understanding of human faces onto objects that are very, very far from human faces. So rather than having an enormous model of all possible objects, all possible faces, all possible things that could be in the world, what these sort of examples are telling us is that we're astoundingly flexible. We're able to project in the moment um, our understanding of how human faces work into objects which are very, very different. And not just project to the extent that we think, oh, a face, but we project the specifics, we project rich emotions. And give me a moment more, or give yourself a moment more, and you'll be able to tell plausible stories about why these, these faces are feeling the things they're feeling. What's happened to them? What might happen next? The ability to build improvised stories uh, is, is quite astonishing. But that ability to improvise is, is, is really what makes us such remarkable creatures. And we should uh, not fool ourselves into thinking that the stories are, as it were, already wired into our brains and we're just reading them off. We're making them up as we go along. Um, Let me give you a a final final image before we close. And these are stamps, uh, Swedish stamps, by the uh, graphic artist Oskar Reutersvarn. And they are impossible stamps. They're impossible figures. If you look closely at any of them, you'll realise that... uh, they, these are 3D objects that look terribly credible, but really couldn't be built. The different pieces just don't fit together. And I think those, well, those are very interesting uh, from the point of view of my thesis 
in two ways. Going back to the, the way, where we started with vision, that sense that these are 3D objects is very interesting because though they can't possibly embed in 3D, they aren't possible, possible things at all, though that's not, the, fact, the fact that that's not obvious to us is telling us that we're only taking pieces of these objects and analyzing them um, one by one. So if I look, for example, at the cubes on the, on the uh, left-hand side, I can see each of those cubes looks like a perfectly sensible cube. And I look at the cube next to it and the cube next to it, I see a perfectly coherent row of cubes, absolutely no, no problem. It's only when I try to put the whole thing together that I have a sense of jarring. Somehow things just don't work. But if I could put all that information together instantly, I just have a kind of does not compute, this is not a 3D object reaction. I don't have that because I can't put it all together. I can only piece it together gradually and realize there's something wrong. And so that's very interesting because that, that, that's telling me that uh, my sense of the way a vision works can't be correct. It can't be the case that I take everything I see and load it up and, and construct a, a, a single understanding of it. Because if I could do that, I'd re immediately realize these were impossible objects. I only piece things together gradually. But more important for us, I think, is that this is a metaphor for how the mind is generally. If you ask me to explain one uh, thing, one preference, one feeling, uh, one thought, I'll give you an explanation. And if you want me to explain that one, I'll explain that too. And I'll piece together a little chain of locally consistent stories. But if you try to piece together all the things I say, you'll find you can't. Because not, not because I misspoke and that there really is a coherent story inside me, but I just kind of got it mixed up, but because I'm improvising always. I'm making up the story as I go along. And like any author, I can't really make it up a story which is really coherent because I'm inventing it. I can't take account of everything I said before. I very soon start to say things which are contradictory to what I said before. In fact, I'm full of contradictions. We all are. Um, that's the, 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 the nature of, of human, human thought. But each local piece of information is, uh, is, is coherent. Now, minds as traditions, how does that fit in? Well, the point is that it's true that um, we're improvising. And it's true that we're not fully coherent. But what we're, what we're trying to do is to be as coherent as possible, to make our thoughts now as coherent as possible with our thoughts yesterday. So when I say I like something, as in um, Petty Johansson and Lars Hall's experiment with the, the choices between faces, when I say I like something and you say why, I'll try and give you a story about that. So I'll try to be as consistent as I can. So I'll build my current thoughts as much as I can on past thoughts. So it's like a storyteller who's trying to be consistent with the earlier parts of the story. But as I say, for every storyteller, that's really too difficult. There's con always contradictions everywhere. So finally, I want you to think that the mind itself, our intuitive idea of the mind is full of a great seething mass of, of beliefs and, and desires and, and principles of all kinds. It, the mind itself really is an, is, a, is an impossible object, just like Richard's figures. Um, there is no set of beliefs, preferences, or principles that can I explain or underpin the way my mind works. It's a continual seething jumble. But it's a jumble that I'm continually reconstructing and continually trying to reconstruct better. And that's what makes me, me, and you, you. We have a different histories, different thoughts we thought before, and different thoughts we're trying to, to, to create in the future. Uh, but what is not the case is that either of us, uh, any of us, are coherent. And that's absolutely fine. What we are is spectacularly creative.